Hello and a very warm welcome to today's webinar on the development of an ethical framework in equestrian sport. Our session will consist of two parts. Firstly, a series of four brief presentations, and we will hear about the development of the framework from two of the team at the Royal Veterinary College, co-supervisor of the research project, Dr. Madeline Campbell, and master's research student, Bluebell Brown, followed by two people who were involved in the research project and took part in it, Susan Hawes and Jenny Hall. The second part is where we'd really like your input with your questions for our panel discussion, as we should have a good amount of time, hopefully 40 minutes if we're running to time for the question and answer session. On top of hearing your queries, today is also about feeding back to all the participants who so kindly gave their time to be part of this important project. So now just to cover off a few pieces of housekeeping, we are recording this session and the presentations will be made available publicly afterwards, but the recording of the Q&A, the second part of the session, will be for our internal use only. We won't be taking any audio comments from the floor during the Q&A, so please don't raise your hand during that, that part of the session. However, to submit your questions, please use the Q&A function on Zoom. And if you see a question that is the same or similar to your query, then please do upvote that question. And you are very welcome to use the chat function to make general comments or chat amongst yourselves. But if you have a question for the panel, then please do use the Q&A tab on Zoom. It's so much easier for me to manage and I need all the help I can get. So by the way of a very brief background to today's meeting, World Horse Welfare is the only global equine welfare charity that engages with horse sport on welfare issues. We strongly believe in the horse-human partnership and actively support the participation in competitive sport so long as their welfare is put first. And in this regard, we have had long associations as advisors to the FEI, the BHA and other national associations. And this is a growing strategic area of our work. Why? In part is because we live in a world where there are increasing societal concerns about the involvement of horses in competitive sport. Is it cruel? Is it ethical? Just this year, the ethics of horse sport have been sharply put in the spotlight, from the infamous photo of Gordon Elliott sitting on a dead horse, to this summer's Panorama programme, which raised serious questions about the treatment of former racehorses, to the disturbing spectacle at the women's modern pentathlon at the Tokyo Olympics. Little wonder, then, that the public is asking whether horse sports are inherently unethical. In reality, it will never be ethical for someone from an animal rights perspective who believe it is never ethical for people to use animals in any way. But animal rights do not have a monopoly on ethics. For the vast majority of people, involving animals with our lives, including horses, is ethical and can be mutually beneficial, so long as their welfare is fully considered and is put first throughout their lives. So horse sport can do so much to demonstrate its ethical basis in order to maintain public acceptance, or put another way, its social license to operate. And this is why World Horse Welfare initiated this project with the Royal Veterinary College, with the aim of helping horse sport to have a consistent ethical basis to underline their decision making, and so underwrite their continued social license to operate. So without further ado, I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Madeline Campbell, who along with Professor Christine Verheyen are the supervisors for this research project. Maddie will be well known to many of you. She is Senior Lecturer in Human Animal Interactions and Ethics at the Royal Veterinary College and chairs the British Veterinary Association's Ethics and Welfare Advisory Panel among many, many other roles. And Maddie will introduce the genesis of the framework and how it functions as a practical tool. Maddie, over to you. Thank you very much, Rolly, and I'm going to go ahead and try and share my screen with you now. So I'm assuming that can be 
seen okay now, Basil, you'll let me know if not. Um, I just wanted to start off with a, a few thank yous. I wanted to thank all of the stakeholder participants who've been involved in this research over the last year, as will become very evident when Bluebell gives her presentation in a few minutes time. Um, your involvement has been really crucial and we're hugely grateful to you. Of course, I wanted to thank World Horse Welfare for funding the research and particularly the members of the project review group for their input throughout. And I wanted to thank Professor Christine Verheyen, who, as Rolly just mentioned, has co-supervised Bluebell's MRES project. And of course, I want to thank Bluebell for all the very hard work which she's done on this over the last year. So as Rolly said, I just wanted to say a few words at the outset, really to explain the genesis of this whole research project, why we felt an ethical framework for the use of horses in sport was needed and what our aims were in developing it. And I, like I imagine almost everyone joining the meeting today, um, you know, I'm very involved in the equine world. I'm a keen amateur rider and breeder. And of course, I'm also an equine vet and a European veterinary specialist in animal welfare, science, ethics and law. And so because of all of those involvements, I've been very aware for, I suppose, about the last decade or so, really, about the challenges um, that face equestrian sport and also very aware about the genuine will across the equine world to address those ethical challenges head on in order to protect and to promote equine welfare. Because of um, my job, I'm, I'm lucky to often attend um, a number of different stakeholder meetings and a lot of conferences. And what had come obvious to me in, in the last two or three years or so is that there were a lot of conversations going on across equestrian sport uh, about ethical issues um, and how we might address them. And that those conversations were often being repeated within different sports. So I would go to a meeting with one uh, sports stakeholder and hear a particular conversation about ethics. And then I might go to a meeting in a different sport and hear a very similar conversation. So there was a bit of repetition going on. And what was also striking was that quite often people were struggling to kind of reach conclusions in those discussions. And when I thought about why that might be, it, I identified it as the reason, the fact that really none of us within equestrian sport had a kind of clear framework or a clear way of approaching ethical issues as and when they crop up. Um, and so really that was the genesis of, the, of this whole research. The, perceived need to identify a kind of um, consistent method which those of us within equestrian sport can use to address ethical issues in order to fulfill this genuine shared aim of promoting and protecting equine welfare. So I'm just going to describe to you for a couple of minutes how I went about uh, developing the theory of this new framework. And then Bluebell is going to go on and describe to you all of the work which she's done over the last year to bring it to the stage it is now um, of being something which can be easily applied by those across uh, equine sport. I started off um, by looking at sports ethical frameworks because of course a lot of um, the issues which arise in uh, equine sport arise also in human sports. And so I started off uh, by looking at human sports ethical frameworks. And then I went looking for um, ethical frameworks which were to do with the use of animals in sport, but it quickly became apparent there really weren't uh, any, although of course there are a number of animal welfare frameworks, but ethics and welfare are, are not quite the same. And so I reviewed both of those and, and looked at um, how they'd been put together uh, what worked well, what perhaps worked less well, and what we might take from those kind of frameworks, which would be useful um, to developing the ethical framework for the use of horses in sport. And the theoretical framework which I developed was published earlier this year. I've put the reference up on the screen uh, for you here. And I'm just going to describe it very briefly, really, in order to enable Blue to carry on and describe all of the work which she's been doing. So, um, at the centre of it were three things which identified as being really crucial to the ethical use of horses in sport. And, and the argument I've made is that the use of horses in sport is ethical, as Rowley was just describing, uh, provided that we fulfil these three criteria, which I originally called central tenets. 
And the three criteria are, as you can see them on the screen here. So first of all, that negative welfare effects are minimized, and also importantly, that positive welfare effects are maximized. And then that any avoidable and therefore unnecessary risks are identified, and that having identified them, we mitigate against them. So we have to search out risks, and once we've identified them, we have to work out what we can do to reduce them. And then finally, that all governing body regulations and law are, are complied with. And that sounds like a rather low barrier, um, but it's obviously a very important one to ethical sport and to concepts of fair play um, and those kind of things. On the screen here, you can see a diagrammatic uh, representation of this theoretical framework kind of at the stage it was when I had finished uh, developing it. And I, I don't want you to worry about trying to read your way through this rather busy slide because as you'll see, um, and Blue is about to present to you, it is now much simpler than it was um, a year or so ago. But I just wanted to use this to explain to you its essential function. So it starts off having defined those three uh, central tenets. It then has to define an ethical question, the thing that whoever is using it is interested in looking at. You identify all of the stakeholders and what their interests in the issue are. Um, and then one identifies relevant legislation and regulation, for example, governing body rules. Um, and then you look at whatever relevant evidence. Um, and that might be peer reviewed evidence, but of course it can also be a wide range of other types of evidence um, from lay publications to surveys to anecdotal evidence and so forth. And Blue will talk a bit more about that. And then all that the framework is really is just a step-by-step -step way of working through decision-making in order to reach some kind of consensual opinion at the end of it. And again, Blue is going to describe this to you more in a few minutes time, but a lot of it centers around a harm benefit uh, analysis. I just wanted to finish with one last slide, trying to make very clear what the framework doesn't do and what it's really not meant to do. Um, because it is important to keep this in mind in order to understand what it is. So the framework is not meant to provide anyone with a so-called correct answer to any particular question which they might be looking at. It's simply a tool. It's a tool for analysis or a method which we can all employ across equestrian sports whenever ethical issues crop up for us. And so that's, it, that's its use to us, is that whenever we're faced with a particular ethical question, we can say, okay, well, well we can look at it using this framework and we know how to do that because it's been laid out and we know we, we follow these various steps and we can do that across sports. So the advantage of having the framework from an external point of view is that when we apply that, we are using a consistent method and that enables us to demonstrate to the outside world that as stakeholders in equestrian sport, we take ethical issues very seriously um, and we have a recognized method of approaching them, of analyzing them, and which we can use to enable us to reach evidence-based decisions or to formulate evidence-based policy. And, and that's really what its function is. So with that, I shall hand back over to Roly and, and then on to Blue to tell you more about how it's been developed in the last year. Thank you. Maddie, thank you very much indeed. Um, I think we'll stop sharing those slides. Brilliant. And um, thank you, Maddie. And just to remind people that around asking questions, please do use the Q&A function, the Q&A function on the Zoom below, and we'll have plenty of time to get around to questions after we've heard from our following three presenters. So now I'm delighted to, to introduce RBC research student Bluebell Brown to explain how the framework was tested, as Maddie said, and refined through stakeholder participation. Blue, ever since she's got involved with this project, her, her enthusiasm and energy has been truly infectious. So I, I'm really looking forward to, to this. Blue, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So can you see my slides okay, Basil? Everything looks okay? All good. Great, perfect. So hi, good afternoon, everybody. I'd first like to thank World Horse Welfare for giving me this opportunity to be involved in this project. And I'd also like to thank uh, Madeline Campbell and Christine Verheyen as my supervisors this year for all of their guidance and support. 
And lastly, I'd like to thank all the participants that took part in this relatively long process of the study, because without you, the study just wouldn't have been possible. So thank you very much. So over the next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to take you through the stages of this study, what we found, what changes we made to the framework, and what the framework is like now. My slide, there we go. So the study methods. So to recap on the aim of this study, we were trying to develop a coherent ethical framework for the use of horses in competitive sport, which can be applied across disciplines for the benefit of equine welfare. So how did we go about doing this? Well, we use what's known as the Delphi technique, and this involves a repetition of rounds so that we can test the framework and get expert opinion on what it's like to use, what's good, what can be improved, and whether participants would be willing to actually use this framework in the future for ethical decision making. As you can see on the slide, in this study, we use three rounds. So what does a round involve? In each round, participants were given a predetermined ethical question and had to apply the framework steps to try and come to a decision. When this was finished, they then had to complete a short questionnaire, which included questions about things like age, gender, industry role and discipline. The questionnaire also included six statements where participants were asked to indicate whether they agreed or disagreed or neither with the statement. And this was on a seven point scale. So this scale ranged from strongly disagree to strongly agree. We really needed to ask these questions to determine if people understood how to complete the framework and did they understand the terminology? Because to be able to complete something, you first need to understand and we also needed to know with a certain age. So we provided a work through example of the um, framework and the inclusion of a stakeholder matrix. So this is a table to help people complete the harm benefit analysis. Are these effective aids? We also needed to know, does it work as a decision-making tool? And do participants find that completing each of these steps enables them to come to a conclusion on the specified issue? and of fundamental importance, would participants be willing to use it to make decisions in the future? Because the tool will only work if participants are willing to take it off. After each of these questions, respondents could comment to express their opinions. And lastly, within the questionnaire, we had two open questions, which were, what did you like about the framework? And what did you think could be improved? So these questions helped us identify specific components of the framework that need to be modified and give us an overall picture of how the framework functions. So within the study, we were not looking at the decision that participants arrived at, but rather engagement with the process. And after all the data had been collected, you can see here on the screen within these blue boxes, um, I performed descriptive statistical analysis on engagement with the framework, and I looked at the agreement and disagreement percentages and the spread of this data. Aside from numbers, we need to adapt the information to get a feel for participant opinions. And all comments were analysed by using what's known as Braun and Clark's six-step thematic analysis. So this is where themes that run throughout the, all of the comment data are identified. After analysing the results of each round, I made changes to the framework based on these results. I then sent feedback to the participants, which summarised the key themes from the comments sections within the participant questionnaire, along with the actions that were taken by the research team based on this feedback. And this revised framework, free, excuse me, this revised framework was then tested in the next round. So, it was actually in the study. We had a broad range of participants from various roles across the question sports, as you can see in the slide on the screen. And we had an age range of 23 to 75 and a broadly equal split between genders. So all participants identified as either men or women. So in round one, in round one, all participants were asked to address the same question, which related to the drug Omeprazole. So this is a drug that's used to aid in improving healing and preventing the occurrence and recurrence of gastric ulcers. Participants were provided with information about Omeprazole and then asked to try and use the framework to answer the question, should the use of a map result be allowed in competition? So the key results from round one were as follows. Though some stakeholders found using the framework thought-provoking and holistic, 
there was a lot of variation in how easy participants found it to use the framework. So some participants found it easy, um, found it logical, methodical and structured, and they liked the layout. However, others thought it was too long, too academic and too time consuming. So at the end of round one, <coughs> fewer than 50% of participants agreed with the statement, I understood how to complete each part of the framework. At another further statement, the framework steps enabled me to come to a conclusion and a further statement of, I would use this framework to make decisions in the future. So after round one then, what was changed? Well, the framework content was reworded into lay terms to make the process more accessible to non-academics. A similar framework step to a combined to simplify and shorten the process. To help participants understand how to complete each part of the framework, increased guidance is provided, and this was within the framework instead of as a separate document, and this is really for ease of access. Guidance was provided on the different types of literature to include within um, the evidence step, where to search, and what information is needed to complete the testing of the framework correctly. Guidance is also provided on to how to clarify and how to carry out the harm benefit analysis. So, in round two, participants were given an ethical dilemma specific to the discipline in which they are involved. So, for example, we had questions like, should young horse classes be allowed? Should there be an upper weight limit for polo players, etc.? So, how did the participants get on? Well, the key results from round two show that stakeholders again found using the framework thought provoking and holistic, and they liked that it was a rational process with practical and scientific elements that considered a variety of stakeholders. They also found that the worked example was very helpful. However, they thought it was still too long, too complex and too academic. So at the end of this round, 70% of participants agreed with the statements, I understood how to complete each part of the framework and the framework steps enabled me to come to a conclusion on the issue, while 53% of the participants said that they would use it in the future. So here are some participant quotes from round two. The first is, the framework provides a helpful structure for setting out the arguments for and against a decision and identifying what evidence there is and what additional evidence could be sought. If this framework is extensively adopted, then better decisions will be made because it will ensure a consistent process is followed to make those decisions. And the second quote is, the framework is interesting, but as a professional of many years, I'm not sure I would have much use for it, but I can see how it might benefit other stakeholders and analysts themselves and to know my full thing. So what did we change after round two? Well, some of the framework content was reworded and several steps were combined to simplify and shorten the process. So the work through example was removed from the appendix and made as a standalone document. And on the basis of participant suggestion, possible stakeholders were all included within the harm benefit analysis table. So this is called the stakeholder matrix that I referred to earlier. So in round three, participants were asked to test the framework working in pairs or small groups. And the reason for this is of course, that in real life, we anticipate that this is how the framework will most frequently be used. So participants were grouped based on their discipline and role, as you can see on the slide. So in one group, we had a competitor, a regulator and an owner. In another group, we had a welfare officer and a breeder, so on and so on. So each group worked together during a two hour online session, which included an, introduct which included an introductory segment explaining the process. So key results from round three. Participants again highlighted the aspects of the process that they liked, but in addition, they found it really beneficial to be able to have a discussion with people who have different backgrounds and experience. At the same time, they thought the overall format, so within a Word document, the list of stakeholders and the stakeholder matrix, so this is the table to help complete the harm benefit analysis, these could all be made better. And the group format could also be improved to ensure that all participants who take part in the discussion can contribute equally. So at the end of this round, 92% of participants agreed with the statements, I understood how to complete each part of the framework. The framework steps enabled me to come to a conclusion, 
while 76% of participants said that they would use this framework in the future. So here's a participant quote from round three. It is a long process to work through. However, we were asked a big question, so it warrants this level of background research, evaluation, and discussion to reach a conclusion. The equine industry needs to be aware of some unease, for example, the issue of social licensing and the need to focus on what we're doing, why we're doing it, and does this provide the best welfare for the horse? I think this framework will be an important step to help these questions to be answered. So at the end of round three, based on all the feedback from the stakeholders that very kindly contributed to the study, the framework has changed from nine steps to six. The main changes were rewording of content, shortening and simplifying the process by combining similar steps. Agreement with understanding on how to complete the framework and whether the framework enabled the person to come to a conclusion on the issue increased from below 50% in round one to 92% in round three while using the framework in the future increased from 50% in round one to 76% in round three. <clears throat> and as you can see now on the slide, I will take you through the steps. So step one is the question and background. So the people who are using this, they will um, come up with their question. So to take an example from the study, one of the questions we used was, should the use of bitless bridle during competition be allowed? The background provided for that question was across equestrian disciplines, the permitted use of bitless bridles during competition is increasingly being considered. So step two then is where you would identify any sport rules, regulations or laws related to the question. So if we're thinking about, let's say, so this question was within dressage. So you would be looking at the FEI as the international regulatory body. So you could refer to the veterinary regulations, the general regulations, you could also refer to legislation like the Animal Welfare Act, the FEI Code of Conduct for the horse. So then you'd move on to step three, which is identifying and assessing the evidence. So you can include a range of evidence here. So you can include research, books, reports, um, lay press articles within magazines, stakeholder expert opinion, and of course, your personal experience. So step four then is to carry out a stakeholder harm benefit analysis. And this is where you identify stakeholders that are relevant to the question that may be impacted. So for example, you may say, okay, horses competing in the sport, they are a stakeholder that would be impacted. You would then list the potential harm for the horses that are participating in the sport and the potential benefit. And then you go through this for each stakeholder that you think is relevant to the question. So for example, you could include horse owners, grooms, the veterinary team, things like that. So you then move on to step five, which is thinking about the key considerations. So Madeline mentioned these earlier. They were previously um, known as the central tenants. So these are key principles that you need to take into account when coming to your decision. So they are minimization of negative welfare and maximization of positive welfare for horses and identification of and prevention against avoidable unnecessary risk to horses. And then the third key consideration is, of course, compliance with governing body regulations and the law. So step six, then, is where you come to a decision on your question. And this is based on the evidence that you've gathered and assessed, your harm benefit analysis, and the principles of the key considerations. So it's important to note that it's not always possible to come to a black and white answer. You know, there may be cases where you need more evidence or you may have come to a decision that has certain caveats and this is completely fine and acceptable. Uh, it's also important to note that when working in groups, um, conflict and disagreements can occur and this is completely fine and acceptable it's just important for the group to note this down and to see can you resolve these conflicts by referring back to your um, harm benefit analysis re-looking at the evidence that you've gathered and assessed and also again thinking about the key considerations so within this process all opinions of each group of each stakeholder within the process are equal you would then set a date to review your decision. So this ends my presentation of the study over this past year. 
and Madeline can happily talk a little bit about what, where we plan to take the work in the future. But for the time being, I would like to hand back to Roland. Thank you all very much. Lou, thank you very much indeed for that really sort of concise overview of the framework. Um, now, before we get into the questions, and just a reminder, please, that they're starting to come through on the Q&A function on Zoom, so please do add them there. Um, and we will also talk about next steps for, for this project as well, because it's certainly not a, a one-year initiative, but we'll, we'll come on to that shortly. But we're now going to move on to the two speakers um, who took part in the research to provide their personal perspective, I just wanted to stress this, is, is their personal perspective on the experience and their thoughts on the framework. So firstly, I'm delighted to introduce Susan, Susan Hawes, who's an FEI international endurance rider and former national champion, who is a solicitor who from time to time is asked to join anti-doping and other disciplinary panels by the BEF. So Susan, over to you. Good afternoon, everyone, and um, may I say how uh, very honoured I'm asked to, uh, that I've been asked to speak this afternoon. I just wanted to take you through um, my participation in the progress uh, in this program to explain um, how I felt about it. Um, so on the screen, you'll see the um, the steps uh, that we went through, um, and because I'm an endurance rider. I was um, very interested to take part in this study because endurance has not been without its controversy as regards horse welfare. So I joined in round two. Um, and as part of that round, I was given a question about show jumping, which I know very little about. Um, but I had an open mind about it and I went through the process and I came out with a conclusion at the end as required. But what I found difficult about it was that there was nobody to challenge me. I didn't really know if I'd come up with the right conclusion. I didn't really know if I'd looked at the right evidence. Um, so it, it seemed to work as a process, but I wasn't sure how good my outcome was. Um, however, um, when we went to round three, it suddenly got much better because I was joined by two people who had no experience of endurance but a question was an endurance riding question so it was one where I was a bit of an expert and had some people to question me and challenge me so the question we were asked to look at is um, as follows and I'll read it out under endurance GB rules a novice horse which must be five years old can compete in up to 10 endurance competitions to a maximum distance of 450 kilometers or 280 miles. Is it appropriate for a novice horse to be allowed to complete such a large distance in its first year of competition? So really to summarize, is it okay for five-year-old horses and above to be asked to do 280 miles in their first year of competition? Now, um, the ability to do that has been around in the Endurance GB rules really since EGB was set up. Um, and I've always felt personally quite um, nervous about it because it seems like an awful long way for me me to take a horse and I've never actually um, taken a horse in, in 10 rides in its first season um, but what this forced me to do was to explain the problem to my two colleagues who had very open minds about it and then um, to start going through this framework so we looked at the endurance GB rules and the FEI rules um, and I explained them. And then we looked for evidence. Now there's really great evidence available to look at here. And that's the Endurance GB database, because in that database, you can go to one section of it and find the names of the, the top 10 horses that did um, their novice seasons and how far they got in their first year. And a lot of them do do 10 rides. Um, and then you can track their progress through the, the database and see whether they were competing the next year and whether they were competing five years later. Um, and I'd never actually done that before, gone through and had a look at what had happened to those horses. Um, so we looked at that and surprisingly, to my mind, um, because I'd come into this a question with a bit of a preconceived idea, um, there was no evidence to suggest that those horses were being compromised by ridden, being ridden up to 280 miles in their first season. 
we could track them. We could see that they were still being ridden the next year and three years later. Um, and not, not all of them, because some horses don't go on for lots of different reasons. Maybe their riders dropped out or sold the horse. But we could see strong evidence of horses being continuing to be competed and going on to really quite advanced levels and not having seemed to be harmed about by, by this. And we reckon that that was because the endurance GB rules have been put in place to mitigate the risk of harm were actually really very good. Um, and so we then went on to think about the key considerations after we thought about the stakeholders involved um, and we reached a conclusion. And much to my surprise, the conclusion that I reached was actually, this is okay. It is okay to ride your horse in 10 rides in its first year, provided it's fit enough, provided you take care of the horse and it's not compromised, um, provided the key considerations in step five are thought about, it, it is okay to do it. So that was a surprising outcome for me, because if you'd asked me at the beginning of the meeting, where do you think you're going to come out on this? I would have said, I think we're going to find evidence that this is detrimental. So to me, the bit that really worked well was having two people on that panel who were horsey people and well informed, but really didn't know about um, endurance or the rules of endurance. And they were able to challenge me and get me to explain things to them, which actually made me change my mind. And from my perspective, if you have a framework that enables that level of debate on a controversial topic um, um, and, and can change, cause people to change their mind and think about things in different ways, that's a really good framework process. And so for endurance, if you could take key stakeholders through it who may be start off with the same sort of mindset that I had that this really wasn't fair on the horse and you could take them through that process you might well get them to change their mind um, and it could work the other way of course too you might have a have a practice that once you you thought was okay and once you'd run it through this process you realized actually you could do with some more mitigants in here because the, the horse's welfare is not being taken care of so that's all I wanted to say today but um, I'd like to thank um, everybody involved in the study and particularly my two colleagues on that final panel session it was really valuable session so thank you susan thank you very much for that and it's fascinating to hear you that you you change your mind i suppose that is one of the ultimate sort of, sort of tests for something like this so thank you for that um now i'm very pleased to introduce to Jenny Hall, just a reminder, please put your uh, uh, questions up on a Q&A function um, if, you, if you've got any. It's, it's, uh, but it's a real privilege to introduce Jenny, who's current head of welfare at the retraining of racehorses and, and currently chair of the FAI Veterinary Committee, who has a wealth of veterinary experience in both horse racing and horse sport. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, both Susan and Jenny are speaking in a personal capacity. So Jenny, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks, Roly, for your kind introduction. As you mentioned, um, I am a qualified veterinary surgeon and worked in first opinion equine practice for many years, including with elite horses in both racing and non-racing sport, before a spell working as a regulatory vet in British horse racing. <clears throat> and I would just like to start off with thanking Madeline for inviting me to share my thoughts on having participated in the second stage of the project to develop this ethical framework and also for including me um, as a participant in the project in the first place. Um, although while as chair of the veterinary committee these are indeed my personal personal views, um, I was very pleased with that hat on to have been able to participate in the project firsthand as it's helped me understand the process um, and, and how we really might engage with it going forwards. So as far as my remarks for now, I've focused these in three sections. What went well, um, what we might do better in the future and the bear traps that I can see. So as far as what went well, probably for me, the first thing was it was just as well that we were in lockdown when this process started, because um, I don't know what I thought I'd signed up for, um, possibly along with one or two other people. When I opened that first zip file and looked at the volume of documents, I was a bit, 
I have to say, I was a little bit taken aback. Um, so I can understand that this was quite a technical process for participants from other backgrounds to follow. Although I'm a practicing vet, um, I'm not an academic, but I, I do think everyone in veterinary practice nowadays is used to the concept of evidence-based medicine. So um, uh, you can understand that sort of approach. And as a regulator, you definitely get used to having to justify everything you do because there'll soon be someone on the phone or Twitter setting out why you're bonkers and have single-handedly put them out of business. Um, I note that Maddie earlier said that this was now easy to use. Um, I'm not sure, I, I think again, um, it helps if you've used it a lot and I've certainly found it easier having been through it a couple of times, but I'm very pleased to hear that there is future support for this because I think it's not necessarily at that stage yet. Um, but one thing, one thing I do think, having had a chance to work with it and a bit of practice, I think the fact that part one, so Madeline's actual framework has been published so we can see it and read it as many times as we like. I think, I think that's helped. I think certainly initially, I was sort of struggling to get my head around the concept. Um, so having, and I'm already can, I can see that we've already had other people commenting on this, that having the structured framework is the real positive in the whole process. Um, so this is, for me, it's like the risk assessment process that's undertaken for business operations. Um, highly skilled managers just automatically go through it through that in their head when they're considering any new intervention. But others amongst us need to follow a standard process to ensure we've considered any relevant issues and recorded them before implementing something new. Um, is this approach an improvement on the traditional hypothesis, literature search, qualitative research and conclusions? I think it is, but we need to be clearer perhaps that this is a development of that process rather than something entirely different. Um, you know, it, it might be, obviously we've all listened to Madeline's presentation so we can hear how it, it is different, but it's probably not sort of fundamentally something out of left field. It might look like it when you first read it, but I'm not sure that it is really. Another key thing that I absolutely thought went well was having the participants that considered the questions come from the complete cross-section of stakeholders. And I think this is the other key strength and something that we need to ensure happens when the framework is used in the future. Um, I note that in, round, in the round one feedback, some participants felt generally unsure of expectations particularly about how long they should spend on gathering evidence, whether the personal experience counted as evidence and how long their answers to each part of the framework should be and whether they were completing the framework correctly. Um, and I would, you know, I would echo all of those and, and think the worked examples were, were helpful and helpful in guiding us all. But this leads me on to one of the challenges I found and that is with accessing and valuing the published scientific literature. You know, a lot of articles are, be, are still behind paywalls. Um, I know this can be overcome and you can contact the original author, um, but I'm wondering, is this easier with a university library affiliation? And, and, is, and if so, is this something that could be facilitated as a resource going forwards? Um, science should be open and discursive, and today is obviously a good example of that. So what could we do better in the future? Um, how do we ensure that we maintain that cross-section of contributors? Um, it's essential to avoid groupthink and to achieve a relatable outcome. And, and Susan has clearly just outlined to us how the group that she was part of worked particularly well. But another real key point for me is how do we define expert opinion? Um, I'm sure that it's important to include this as a category, but I think in order to really capture the amalgamation of lay observations and experiences that I'm absolutely sure needs to be included, we, we need to broaden this input. Like who do you class as an expert? Um, those that really know the facts may not recognize themselves as such a person as they're not labeled with a specific qualification. And I think it's a big challenge to ensure that those with practical operational experience of the topic under consideration, have that knowledge articulated. And I just want to talk about two examples to highlight what I think I'm talking about here. Um, the first one, and this slightly came up, and um, the group I was part of was um, the National Hunt, National Hunt Group. 
Um, and so the example I want to give is, Andrew, is when Andrew Tullock led the modification of the Grand National Fences. Um, there was no one closer to the whole issue than Andrew, but how much of his expertise and insight um, that he ensured went into that process would have been picked up by this framework. We can all see from the outcome what a massive improvement those changes have been um, in the, on so many occasions when in the past a horse would have fallen, um, the jockey's now unseated. So instead, while the outcome's the same and that the horse is out of the race, the likelihood of the horse being injured has decreased substantially. But there weren't any published science, there wasn't really any published scientific literature to guide that process. So the other example um, is more recent and obviously less of a dramatic change. Um, but I want to highlight the implementation by the FBI on July the 1st this year of the ban on clipping sensory hairs on horses' faces. I mean, this was voted for unanimously at the General Assembly, so as part of the rulemaking process. And you know, we all agreed that this was the right way forward on the veterinary committee. But when you look, there's not much in the scientific literature. There's absolutely really nothing about um, that's specific to the horse. Um, there's research in other species, but not in the horse. But clearly, everyone's sort of learned experience of working with horses recognizes that this, is, this was a positive way forward. So what I, I suppose my conclusion is qualitative research and interviews are essential, in my view, if accurate conclusions to be drawn. And this would avoid an overly academic approach for respondents. So I think the framework is still quite complicated and is perhaps still more structured to that academic approach that, rather than the sports practical participants. Um, and as we all know, there's a big difference between reading something and having the actual hands-on experience and knowledge, which can, as we all surely recognise, be very nuanced and complex. <clears throat> I do think it'll be easier to use with real life policy questions. And inevitably for me, it felt a little bit contrived and prejudged by the style of the questions. So for example, um, in our group, and now I, uh, yeah, here we go. Let me just share that. Oh. Basil, can you? If you um, press yeah, back. It's all twice. right, I've done it now. So in our group, this was our question, was should, should the number of runners in the Grand National be further reduced? Well, perhaps if we frame the question as, is the current number of runners in the Grand National the right number? Um, but again, you know, that's I think that's just being picky. Um, clearly, Bluebell had to start somewhere with her questions. Um, and once you get into real life use of these things, then the questions posed will be relevant to the policy decision being asked. Um, how do we check that the, how do we ensure there's sufficient checks and balances on the process? Um, we've got to ensure that we don't create harms that don't ultimately improve animal welfare, that just shift the problem elsewhere. Um, so for example, what I'm thinking of here is when the UK decided to go ahead on its own and ban dry sow stalls back in 1999, um, before the rest of the EU imposed that ban in 2013, this resulted in a 40% drop in UK sow numbers. Uh, the, so the breeding pig herd was decimated, but it didn't change pork consumption in the UK. So I just think, um, and for me, the worked example on turnout rang alarm bells for me as well. I, I felt it had quite easily come to the conclusion that all horses should have daily turnout. Um, and again, this is an example for me where it's easier for the world to accept a, perhaps a simple lie than a complex truth. Um, so the possible need to include more of a focus on the potential unintended consequences of the decision being taken. So as well as looking up to answering the question, then potentially look sort of beyond it and make sure that we really do capture that as well. Um, you know, aesthetics and anthropomorphism are not proxies for animal welfare. And this is one of the unintended consequences. And I know Rowley in his introduction um, mentioned the, the an animal rights people and, and the vegan, vegan community. Um, and you know, and a lot of people are practicing vegans, but have, are quite happy with, with um, sport as well. 
and this was something that I wasn't aware of, uh, not being a Telegraph reader, until one of my group um, brought it to my attention. Um, and if you read this article, this poor, poor girl, she's only 19. Um, she was the, she's the first vegan contestant on Bake Off, and she has obviously had a, a real drubbing on social media so that she's had to come off Facebook um, because she was being, she was called a hypocrite for riding horses. Um, like a, a, for, as a quote, please don't say that you're passionate about ethics when you still ride horses. Saying that you're passionate about ethics and then riding horses is completely contradictory and confusing. So I'm just, just I suppose, um, I don't want to be negative, but being a realist, um, you know, we, we have to be careful that we don't provide ammunition um, for our opponents because I'm sure all of us are here today because part of our life is the enjoyment of, of doing stuff with horses and interacting with them. Um, and I guess, again, it's just thinking about the unintended consequences that we might inadvertently get um, involved in. But, um, these are my conclusions you know what i felt went really well was the, the structured framework as i say the publication of part one and the diversity of participant input um, and i think what we'll do better is we will all be more familiar with the process i do wonder about that access to um, scientific publications and, and what how that could be facilitated um, and th what i think is not so simple to achieve is this documentation of the the lived experience and how to capture those, um, you know, they really are technical experts, but they might not label themselves as that. They might not feel that, you, and, and, and it's not so easy to articulate um, some of those inputs, but I think that was captured in one of the comments um, that Bluebell shared. And I think even, even trying to document um, that input is, is a huge step forward. And, you know, thanks very much, World Horse Welfare, for funding this work, for Bluebell, for your energy in making it happen and being prepared to, I can't imagine having to get everyone to engage with this and organise everything online, um, how much easier it would have been if we'd been able to have in-person meetings. Um, but certainly, look, thanks for being part of the process and looking forward to engaging with it going forwards to how we can use it most effectively. Jenny, thank you very much indeed. You've certainly given us lots of thought, uh, sort of food for thought there. We've, we're running out of time. Um, I was going to put this myself, but in fact, Anka Maddie has, has asked a question for me. Beyond today's event, how will the revised framework and its use be publicised so we can direct college, colleagues and students to it? What's the future? for the framework? So uh, in immediate terms, as I said, Blue's work will be uh, put forward for peer reviewed publication. And then obviously we'll try and make sure um, that there's lay impact out of that as well. And, and you might want to say a couple of words directly about, um, you know, how we'll uh, publicize what's been going on today. And we're very grateful obviously to, the, to everyone's input. Um, looking forward, thanks uh, to the support of, of World Horse Welfare, their continuing support. The plan now is, as we've already described is, uh, to, to kind of roll out the application of the framework to the grassroots level and also very importantly in next steps uh, to spend some time and I'm delighted to say that Dr Jackie Cardwell will be joining the project as a supervisor in this due to her experience in this area as well um, to spend proper time looking at uh, what might be barriers to uh, people taking up and using the framework and what might incentivize people to do so because you know at the end of the day from the beginning the project has been all to do with, with working with stakeholders to produce something which can be applied in practice and so we really need to understand how we make that happen so that will be a significant part of the next research going forward. Brilliant. 
Uh, Maddie, thank you so much. And I just wanted to say thank you very much to everyone for joining us today. And I hope you, I hope, really hope you found it of interest. You've been brilliant on your questions. I think we've answered 23 out of 34. Um, that's not bad. I never got a score like that at school. So thank you very much indeed for, for uh, submitting so many great questions and to the panel for answering them so well. Now, after a break, we have asked a handful of people from different areas of horse sport to take part in brief group discussions around the, how the framework might be best utilised in their disciplines or area or indeed wider areas. But we will, short, we will share the conclusions of this discussion, these discussions, along with an overview of all today's Q&A and, and presentations in a brief report that we'll send out later this month. So we'll send that to absolutely everyone. So it just remains for me to say a special thank you to Susan and Jenny for giving up their time to present today and to answer questions so well along with you Maddie and Blue and just as a reminder if you're joining us for the second session which is going to start in 15 minutes time at 3 p.m uk time please do use the separate link that we've sent to you so this is very much the first um, station along a journey um, and we very much look forward to sharing that journey and traveling on that journey with you all um, and in the first instance we'll do so by sending out the report later this month Thank you so much again, and we'll see you soon.